Uh, hey everybody, my name is Steve Kyle. I'm uh, have the privilege of being at Elmer Church. Uh, we're going to be looking at Jonah chapter three tonight in our Bible study. And before we start there, let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this privilege of studying your word. Uh, help us to always remember what a privilege it is to even be able to sit down and read your word in the morning, or any time for that matter, but to have access to your inspired word in our own language. Uh, we ask for your help in understanding more of it, in practicing more of it in our daily lives, and that we can have a closer walk with you. Son Jesus Christ. Uh, thank you for these men for their taking the time to be here tonight. And again, that um, you help us to learn what each of us need to learn in order to become more Christ like. In the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you. Amen. Amen. Okay, so Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3. <clears throat> I'm not going to recap really much. Um, I encourage you to read on Jonah. It is only four chapters long, so it's a short book. I do want to mention one thing, and you'll have to go to another place in Scripture for this. So you're going to want to keep your finger in Jonah chapter 3, obviously, because we're going to be coming back there. Um, but look at Matthew chapter 12. And I only want to point out one thing, really, that Matthew chapter 12. <coughs> there is a lot of, there has been a lot of talk for probably 150 years or so about the historicity of the book of Jonah. That is to say, is it actually true? Did it actually happen? Or is it allegory and, and essentially myth? Um, and there has even been a lot of talk among, among students of the Bible um, about it. And I only want to say one thing about it, and that is really um, Matthew chapter 12. And in verse uh, 39, uh, Jesus is speaking. He says, uh, oh, we'll start with 38. Then certain scribes and the Pharisees answering, answered the saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said of them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, a greater than Jonah is here. Now the only reason I point those scriptures out is by Jesus Christ's own testimony. He believes in the historicity of the book of Jonah. He believes that Jonah was actually in the whale's belly, the whale meaning the great fish, three days and three nights. Whether he was dead or not is another matter that we'll leave, but based on these scriptures, I would come down on the side of he was dead and was resurrected therefrom. But the other thing is, he believed that the repentance of Nineveh as a city was a historic fact. <coughs> Whether anybody else believes the historicity of Jonah or not, Jesus did. That's all I need to know. I don't care what anybody else says. It doesn't make any difference. Okay, so Jonah chapter 3. Let's simply read this chapter, and then we'll uh, talk further. And this is only 10 verses long. It's a very short chapter. Jonah chapter 3, verse 1. And the word of the... I'm reading King James. may read a little differently than yours. In fact, one or two spots I may actually ask you what yours reads. Uh, Jonah chapter 3, verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. Then he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, covered him with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. 
But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. Okay, so let's look a little more closely at a couple of things. Um, Tom actually used this first diagram I'm going to show you right here in a previous session. And essentially, just to give you an idea of what this is, all of the prophets of the Old Testament, they're usually called major and minor prophets, but when you're a prophet, I don't know that there's such a thing as major and minor. <laughs> That's kind of a, an artificial designation of modern biblical critics. The fact of the matter is, they all prophesy, either foretold or foretold. In any case, this indicates the time frame, the years B.C. being along the bottom. The kings in the next couple of rows, kings of um, Israel and and uh, Judah, and then the prophets up above that, and when they prophesied relative to the years and to the kings. Okay, so you'll notice that the kings stop here in uh, uh, Israel, kings of Israel, with the fall, I don't know if you can see that, but it says fall of Samaria in 740 B.C. Now, you see where Jonah is. Jonah's far over on the left-hand side, right? So he's before the fall. He's before um, Assyria attacked Samaria, attacked Israel was the northern ten tribes, Judah was the southern two. Okay, Samaria was in the north. Assyria attacked them and took Samaria and essentially the country. It was actually 722, but they started in 740. Okay, so it took that long. And they laid siege to Samaria for a long, long time and took the city. In any case, the reason I'm pointing all this out is Jonah was prophesying before there was anything like a Babylonian captivity. Before, when Israel as a nation was still in the land. They were not outside the land. So when Jonah is prophesying to Nineveh, there aren't any Israelites there. There are no Jewish, there's no Jewish culture there at all. None. Okay? These guys are totally godless. They have nothing to do with Elohim at all. So, and I want you to be aware of that because I wasn't sure you were. So Jonah's way over there. The Babylonian captivity is over here. Okay? It's, oh, God, uh, 100, 150 years after Jonah prophesies. When there is, in fact, in Babylon, a Jewish culture because they're transplanted there. But not when Jonah is prophesying. There's nobody there at all that has anything to do with the true God. So I want you to be aware of that because when Jonah walks into this place, it's like... You know, a good analogy might be Corinth. When Paul walked into Corinth, and he was there for a year and a half, man, those guys were the Looney Tunes. I mean, there was a Jewish culture there even to some degree, but not a large one. So when Jonah goes in here, these guys are totally godless. Imagine what he must have had to be like as a prophet, as a man, and prophesy like, even to get their attention as one man. Okay? We'll see a little later. Um, this, well, actually, let's just... So, anyway, I want you to understand that, time frame-wise. Jonah was before all the captivities. Jonah was when everybody was still in the land. Okay, so it's important that you understand that. Um, so let's talk about prophets in general. Because before Jonah, as you saw from the diagram, there weren't prophets. You know, it said, well, sort of, that's not true. <laughs> there, were, there weren't the major and minor prophets that we talk about. Um, but let's first look at just the word prophet. In Hebrew, there are three words for prophet, one of which is kind of major, but they're all three used in 1 Chronicles 29, 29. It says, Now the Acts of David, the king, first and last, behold, they are written in the book of Samuel the seer. That's the word ra. The Hebrew word just means seer. And in the book of Nathan the prophet, that's the word, the Hebrew word nabi, which is the normal word for prophet. It also means seer. It actually means a little bit different than that. We'll look at that. And in the book of Gad, the seer, another word for seer is kose. Okay? So three different words, one of which is used most of the time, and that's the N-A-B-I-Y apostrophe word that's transliterated from Hebrew. So this word, interestingly, it, it's, these guys were, uh, golly, I don't know if we have a modern analogy. These guys were fanatics. They were just fanatics. They couldn't shut up. Okay? This word, the root word of this word, Nabi, 
it meaning is that the root word is to bubble forth as like from a fountain, right? To utter or to bubble forth. And this is the verse I thought of. I was familiar with this verse from Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 9. And then I said, I will not make mention of him. This is Jeremiah talking. I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. These guys were fanatics. They couldn't shut up. Right? That's what these prophets were. It just burned in them. They had to talk. They had to speak about God. And that's what Jonah was like. So, at first he didn't want... You know, we see in chapter 1, God says, go prophesy to Nineveh. He goes the other way because he doesn't want him to repent. He doesn't want him to do that. But here's another thing about the time frame. And this is... I have to qualify this. We're going to go back. I apologize. We're going to go back to the... We're going to go back to this. You'll see that only if you look at time frames. Um, Jonah actually prophesied in the time frame of Jeroboam II, which uh, he reigned from 786 to 746. It's in 2 Kings 14.23 and following. We won't actually read it, but it's in 2 Kings 14.23. In any case, and and uh, Jonah is actually mentioned there. I mean, he's a historic figure that is actually mentioned there. In any case, um, so he prophesied somewhere in the 780s range, right? So you'll see that in 740 is when Assyria comes over and attacks Israel. Doesn't it make you wonder what God's reasoning was for trying to get Nineveh to repent in the first place, to turn to the true God? Because of what was going to happen to Israel, what they were going to do. Assyria, and we'll look at this a little later too, Assyria has a culture was uh, their kingdom, their empire, was more widespread than Rome's was in the New Testament times. And for comparable reasons, warfare-wise, they were very sophisticated, like Rome was, and they were absolutely ruthless. They were the first ones to actually use the tool of transplanting people from home country to where they wanted them to be. And they didn't mistreat them when they did that, by the way. I mean, they, they really wanted the slave labor, so they took care of them. They made sure they were had all the needs met to get them over to where they wanted them. But they took them from their home country and put them over here. The Assyrians were the first ones to do that. And we'll look at that a little later. But I wanted you to understand time frame-wise, because Assyria, Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, with, that Jonah is prophesied to, that Assyria is the country that carries Israel away. Not 20, uh, about 30, 40 years something like that, after Jonah is prophesying to Nineveh. And it doesn't say why God gave Nineveh this chance. I'm not, I don't want to inject anything into the text. But it does make you wonder, in terms of time frames, um, maybe they, that wouldn't have happened to Israel. In any case, let's go on. So the purpose of the prophets, a lot of the Old Testament um, is the, you know, the prophets. The, either the longer books, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, etc., or the shorter books, one of which we're, we're looking at. So, and I don't know that you've really thought about this too much, but the purpose of the prophets, we're just going to read this. This is from a very basic, vanilla, conservative, biblical uh, study, bi biblical dictionary, and it's by Easton. It was written like in the late 1800s, 1897. So, so this is very conservative. We're just going to read this together. Thus a prophet was a spokesman for God. He spake in God's name and by his authority. He is the mouth by which God speaks to men. And we're not going to look at all these specific scriptures. And hence what the prophet says is not of man but of God. Prophets were the immediate organs of God for the communication of his mind and will to men. The whole word of God may in this general sense be spoken of as prophetic. Inasmuch as it was written by men who received the revelation they communicated from God, no matter what its nature might be. The foretelling of future events was not a necessary, but only an incidental part of the prophetic office. The great task assigned to the prophets whom God raised up among the people was to correct moral and religious abuses, to proclaim the great moral and religious truths which were connected with the character of God and which lie at the foundation of his government. Now, the reason I point that out, so let's just read this uh, scripture regarding the purpose of the prophets. This is, I, you may remember reading this when we were studying Ezra. I, I read this a couple of times. This is 
historically, this is kind of the last thing that happened in the Old Testament, 2 Chronicles 36, because then Ezra and Nehemiah is the next thing. Malachi is prophesying at that time, and then there's a 400 year space before the New Testament. Okay. So, 2 Chronicles 36, 15, and 16, And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, the word messengers is the word prophets, rising up at times and sending, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God, and despised his words, and misused his prophets, until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people, till there was no remedy. Now, the reason I point that out is two things, a couple things, that strike me as a reading. So if you're in earnest about, let's say, Mike, let's say you got a big job. You know, you got this, like, it's going to be all you can do to get everything done that you need to get done for that particular day. What are you going to do? You're going to start early. You're going to start first thing in the morning. There's a saying, when I was a kid, there's a saying, the early bird gets the worm. Right? Now, if you've ever heard that saying, that was kind of common to get up and go. Uh, I think it wasn't it. Ben Franklin that said, early to bed and early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. No. So... God was apparently very much in earnest about sending his prophets to his people. Because it says, rising up at times, the times means early. Okay? Your translation probably says that if you read it in another translation. Rising up at times. So God's like, get there early, guys. Go first thing. I want them to hear this. Number one. Number two. Um, look at what they did to the prophets. It says they misused them. They mocked them. Right? And you can see this all through if you, if you read through prophecies in the Old Testament. Oh, it's, it's just all over the place what they did to the prophets. But the last phrase there is, is critical because God is a very patient God. But He does have an end to His patience. There is going to be a consequence. Sooner or later, there's going to be a consequence. And that's what that last phrase talks about, there, until there was no remedy. It finally, Israel finally got to the point through disobedience that they wore out God's patience. He said, okay, fine. Seven years of captivity. And that's when, interestingly, that's when Jeremiah 29, 11 comes in. I know the thoughts that I think of you. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give future and hope. That's, you stay there for 70 years, I'll get you afterwards. Because that's what that verse is talking about. Now, and I'm not saying it's not a great memory verse, but you got to understand the concept here and the, and the context. We're talking about a disobedient people the remedy was, okay, I'm done. You're going into captivity. I'll see you afterwards. That's what Jeremiah 29 is talking about. <laughs> In any case. So the purpose of the prophets was to speak even though they were going to be ridiculed. They were going to be made fun of. They were going to be physically hurt, maybe killed. And there's records of that too. If you read Hebrews 11 or traditional what happened to some of the prophets that... Traditionally, what happened, uh, how they met their ends. They took their lives in their hands. And they did crazy stuff sometimes, based on what God told them to do. Just crazy stuff. You know, Hosea, I think it was, married a prostitute. Go, marry that prostitute. Go on, have kids with her. That's going to be an object lesson to Israel. You go do that. He did it. These guys were made of steel. I'm telling you. They were made of steel. And they couldn't shut up. <laughs> they couldn't shut up. They were just, it was going to come, man. It was going to bubble forth. Even though I don't want to speak, you know, Jeremiah, I don't want to speak, but I couldn't. I couldn't not talk. I couldn't do it. That's what the prophets were about. So when you read the prophets, um, like Jonah, Jonah is going into, and we'll look at this too. Let, well, uh, just interestingly on prophets. I don't know if you know, but Abraham is called a prophet. In, in uh, I think it's Genesis chapter 20. Yeah, Genesis chapter 20, verse 7. Now therefore restore the man his wife, for he, this is referring to Abraham, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you. <clears throat> and then Jesus, of course, is called a prophet. Now, you may be familiar with the famous prophecy in Deuteronomy 18, when Moses says, The Lord God will raise up a prophet out like unto me. Him shall you give and when John the Baptist was on the scene, you know, a bunch of the Pharisees and Sadducees came to him and said, Are you that prophet? Are you Deuteronomy 18.15? But he wasn't. And then in Acts uh, 3, I think it is, Acts 3.20-23, 20 um, Peter, in his speech, calls attention to the fact that Jesus was that prophet. The Deuteronomy 18.15 prophet. So the prophets were just a huge, huge deal. They were men of steel. 
Uh, I'll just mention one other thing about prophets. We're not going to actually read this. I don't think we need to. But prophecy, first of all, it's not foretelling only. In fact, most of the time it's foretelling. It's not necessarily foretelling. I'm not saying it can't be foretelling, but most of the time it's foretelling. You know, God's word is prophetic. Not in that it foretells the future, but it tells us what we're supposed to do. Um, but we don't see it a lot in the church accurately used. It's, in my opinion, based on what 1 Corinthians 14 talks about with the gifts, uh, the manifestations of the Spirit in 12, 13, and then in 14, he talks about tongues, interpretation, and prophecy. And he talks about prophecy, and uh, I mean, we can, let's, let's turn to 1 Corinthians 14. Sorry, couldn't shut up. <laughs> Bird and bones. Yeah, yeah. First Corinthians 14, and we'll only read a couple of verses here, 23 to 25. Um, so, again, this is Paul in um, the Corinthian church setting in order the use of tongues, interpretation of tongues and prophecy. In 1 Corinthians 14, 23, he says, If therefore the whole church be come together into one place, and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not think, say you are mad? They're going to say you're crazy, right? But if all prophesy, and there come in one that believes not or one unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all, and thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest, and so falling down in his face, he will worship God and report that God is in the of truth. Now the only thing I want to point out is, based on Paul's characterization of prophecy, it was very incisive. It cut, to the, it cut to a person's heart. It says, the secrets of your heart will be made manifest. So something in that prophetic office, something in how that prophet would, would prophesy, would speak, would cut right to the heart of a man. And that was supposed to be characteristic of the office of a prophet. We don't see that very often in the, in the, in the modern church. That's, I just wanted to point that out. I mean, it may be that you are uh, have the... Um, function of prophet and you simply haven't exercised that, that may be. Um, many of the prophets in the Old Testament were not learned, highly learned men. I mean, they were like Amos, I think, was a sheep herder. A pig herder, actually, I think it was. In any case, these, these guys were not highfalutin. They were not highly educated. Um, I mean, they weren't anything to write home to mom about. Really. But they couldn't shut up. And their testimony, <coughs> we still read Literally thousands of years later. Thousands of years. Right? These guys spoke, we're talking like Jonah, you saw in those years, 860, you know, 780. So we're talking like 2,000 years after, 2,800 years ago, Jonah's talking. And again, I come down on the side of Jesus. If it wasn't true, I'm guessing it wouldn't have survived. <laughs> really? I mean, so, anyway. Um, enough about prophets. Assyria as uh, so Nineveh is the capital of Assyria. Tell you what, before we get into that, everybody stand up. Or if you don't want to stand up, that's okay. Greet somebody, shake a hand, walk around. Two minutes. If you don't want to stand up, just move a little bit. How are you? Come here. There you go. Remember, Jonah is only prophesying about 40, 50 years before this. 
And it's not that long that Jonah is prophesying to Nineveh and says, Repent! Right? Which we'll talk about repent later too. So, we talked about that. Just so you have an idea of how big the, the and I don't have the modern countries on here, but this is from the Rose uh, Publications maps, which are really, really good, by the way. They do a great job. Um, some of their maps have the modern country border overlays on them, so you can actually see what modern countries are where. I didn't use those, but you can see this is like Turkey and Iraq and Iran and that sort of thing. That's how it was early on, 875, 823. You see the years over there on the right-hand side. The green area was Assyria, right? There you can see that it gets much bigger. That's 745 to 681. This is the time frame when Jonah, what, you know, 745, 746 is when Jeroboam II passed. Okay, so they're getting much, much bigger in the time frame when Jonah is prophesying and then when um, Assyria takes northern Israel. They're expanding all around. And then it gets even a little bit bigger because they come over into what is Egypt as well. So their empire was huge. It was comparable, if you've ever seen the Roman Empire maps, but it was comparable to the Roman Empire. Um, and again, for the same reasons. Um, the Romans were also um, uh, amazing at warfare. And they were ruthless when they needed to be. Um, they also tried not to mess with you know, they didn't do the transplant thing. The Romans didn't. The Assyrians did. Um, they didn't, you know, when they conquered Israel, they didn't take them away. They just raised the whole darn thing, right? Wiped it all out. <clears throat> Even uh, Herod's temple in 70, 70 AD when Jerusalem was destroyed by Titus, he, he, he flattened the whole thing except one wall. And he only left the one wall because he wanted everybody to see how huge it was, what it was that he destroyed he wanted that one example of that one wall to stand because he wanted people to see how huge it was. If you've ever been to Israel, if you have, we were there like 18 years ago, 2000. But if you've ever gone, the blocks that are in the walls <coughs> of Jerusalem, I mean, we're talking these things are hundreds of tons. Wow. I guess the aliens helped them. I, I have no <laughs> idea how they got these things. I mean, we're talking like these are, you know, 20, 30, 40 feet off the ground stacked up, making a wall. The blocks are huge. Some of the weights were estimated at 200 tons. They didn't have cranes. They didn't have that stuff. But they built this. In any case, uh, so he raised the whole thing. So the Romans were master, masters at warfare, as were the Assyrians. The Assyrians were more ruthless. And that's why they reigned for so long, like 700 years, and why their expansion was so large. So let's look back at the text, Jonah chapter 3, verse 3. There's something about this verse, one particular thing, and I'm actually interested, in, depending on what translations you're reading, if any of your translations translate this accurately. I could only find two that did of the, I don't know, probably 50 some that are on Bible Gateway. I could only find two that translated this correctly. So anyway, Jonah 3, 3 says, So Jonah rose and went into Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. So we'll, uh, we'll talk about the three days journey thing, but um, so I'm, I'm learning Hebrew and I'm really, really, really bad at it. <laughs> like, you know, if I'm looking at a Hebrew text, I can pick out like, oh, I know that letter or maybe a word or something like that. So anyway, I, was, I try to follow it because it's the only way I'm going to get familiar with it. I just try to run my eyes over it. You know, I mean, I remember doing that with, when, I, when I wanted to learn Greek before I actually studied Greek. Um, I used to go into the school library where I was going to college. And there's a, this thing is a doorstop. We're talking like it's that tall, that wide, that thick. It's called uh, Liddell and Scott's um, Greek Lexicon for ancient Greek. Right? So, and it's truly that big. And it's huge. So I would open up and I would just look at it. And I couldn't understand things. I mean, like, nothing. I can remember thinking, I don't have, part of my language, a snowball's chance in, of learning this. Not a chance. But, you know, it's just like a kid learning English or somebody learning Assyrian or learning construction and how to read a blueprint or learning IT and what all those terms mean or engineering or whatever field it is. It just takes time. The human brain is going to do it if you expose it long enough to whatever it is you want to learn. So sooner or later, I got it. So I'm trying to do that same thing with Hebrew. Just keep looking and just keep looking. So I was looking at this verse in English and then looked at it in Hebrew. 
And don't you know there was a phrase in Hebrew that wasn't in English? It wasn't in the King James at all. I was really surprised by that. And I can only find two translations. It's this phrase right here. This is from the Tree of Life version, Messianic Jewish Family Bible Society. So Jonah rose and went to Nineveh according to the word of Adonai. Now Nineveh was a great city to God. It specifically says that in Hebrew. Great city to Elohim. That's what it says. The King James doesn't translate it correctly. The New American Standard did. I was really surprised. I mean, those guys are really accurate. They didn't translate this. Do any of yours? I don't know what translations you're looking at, but do any of them translate this correctly? I can only find two. The only other one I can find is, I was familiar with this, Young's literal translation. Robert Young was a guy who did a concordance to the Bible, but it wasn't as exhaustive as Strong's. Strong's is like, he listed every single word like the word the. He listed that in his concordance. Young did a concordance, but didn't do the particles, right? He did a concordance that was a big concordance. Anyway, he did a literal translation of the Old Testament. And Jonah riseth, and he goeth into Nineveh, according to the word of Jehovah. And Nineveh hath been a great city before God, a journey of three days. I don't know why it was a great city to God. I don't know if it had to do with, I don't know what it had to do with. I don't know. I don't want to speculate about that. Based on the years we saw when Jonah was prophesying and what happened subsequently with the Assyrians in Israel. I don't know why it was a great city, but that verse says it was. Do any of your translations translate that? At all? So anyway, that's, that was interesting to me. And then um, just some of the mechanics. You know, when we read God's Word, it's important that we understand the mechanics, some of the mechanics, just so we get a picture of what's really going on. So, uh, back to this verse, let's see, a journey of three days, we're not going to go into the particulars of this, but that's really talking about the size of Nineveh around, if you were walking, it's about 60 miles, and here, here's, so a day's journey was the usual length in the, in the east, well, if you were on an animal, it was like 25 or 30 miles, if you were walking, it was about 20, okay, so what that journey of three days thing, that was how, how big Nineveh was around. That's actually documented in a couple of other historical sources. Um, Herodotus, another historian called Diodorus Siculus, documented that it was about 60 miles in, in circumference and about 20 miles across. So the point being, um, and this is, this is, we'll get to that, this is interesting, but the point being, um, this is a big city. Just, and in contrast, you may remember in the New Testament, there's a reference in the Acts to a Sabbath day's journey. The Sabbath day journey was only a couple thousand feet because it was what was considered to be how far you could walk without violating the no work on the Sabbath law. So you can walk 2,000 feet, you can't walk more than that because if you walk more than that, that's work and you're not supposed to work. No survival. So that was a Sabbath day journey, not a day journey. A day journey was 20 miles walking, a Sabbath day journey was 2,000 feet. Um, anyway. The size of Nineveh. So I, I, uh, I got out the old uh, geometry equations, right? So I know the radius is 60 miles of Nineveh, right? So then I, I tried to figure out the, the area, the land area, because I don't know how big the population was, but I do know how large an area this city covered. It was 60 miles. So interestingly, based on the 60 mile circumference, it covered 286.4 square miles. And cities in the ancient world also included not just where people live, but you know, like pasture lands, maybe you know some some agricultural lands, that sort of thing. So it would include that, and this wasn't necessarily all people. But by way of comparison, in a 2010 census, Charlotte was 297.7. So it was along the lines, circumferentially, land area-wise, it was about the size of Charlotte. I don't know about population. I can't because it doesn't say. But I know that it was the capital of Syria at a time when it was still uh, 150 years before the demise, you know, the, the decline of Assyria as an empire. So I'm guessing it was a thriving city. And again, there were no believers in the, I mean, I, I don't want to make an absolute statement. Was there a believer in the true God? I, I guess that's possible. There is no documented case of Israelites being in or near Nineveh. None of that stuff happens at this time in history. It's much later. And Jonah is going to walk into this and start saying, repent! <laughs> to these people who don't have a clue what he's talking about. Right. 
Um, it talks about you know the king being in sackcloth and ashes. I think you're probably familiar with this, but I want to point it out. You know, sackcloth was actually made of black goat's hair. I mean, it was very rough. It was designed to be rough. It was designed to be abrasive. I mean, the whole idea of dressing in sackcloth. I guess the closest thing we might have maybe would be maybe sort of unrefined wool or something. I mean, that would be about the closest thing we have. I don't know if you've ever felt goat's hair, but it's not soft. <laughs> and it doesn't weave well. <laughs> What's that? Burlap. Yeah, maybe burlap. And although I think this would probably be rougher, but that's probably a good analogy. Um, of course, rough, thick, used for sacks, also worn by mourners. Okay? Um, and then with ashes, it was a sign of sorrow and humiliation. I mean, literally, we're talking like about, let's look at Esther. Esther chapter 4, verse 1, when Mordecai perceived all this was done, Mordecai rent his clothes, put on sackcloth with ashes, and went out in the midst of the city and cried with a loud and bitter cry. So, I don't know if you remember, this is the story of when Haman comes to the king and says, King, there's these people that don't obey you. I think we ought to kill them all. Right? And then Mordecai gets word of that, and this is what he does. He dresses in sackcloth, he puts ashes, he sits there, and he mourns. So that's what the sackcloth and ashes indicated. We'll talk about this. We'll talk about the whole idea of repentance because um, it's important to understand what the Bible talks about, what, what it means. I think we have a religious idea of repentance. That's at least I do. I think in general there's, there's a kind of hyper-emotional religious idea of what repentance is, and it's not really that. Biblically, and we'll, we'll talk about the whole why. Um, Matthew eleven twenty one. I thought this was great too. This is Jesus Christ speaking. What one do you, Corazon? What one do you, Bethsaida? For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. So Corazon and Bethsaida, he was there. He did miracles in those cities. Tyre and Sidon were heathen. They were up north. They weren't in Israel, right? So he's saying, if if I did up there where they don't believe in. What I did down here where you do, they would have repented. And you didn't. That's what he's, that's the analogy he's drawing here. And the repentance was again indicated by the sackcloth and ashes. So. Um, just a blurb on fasting. I don't because it's mentioned, I want to mention it. Um, I think there's let, let's look at Isaiah 58. Isaiah 58. There was only, I learned actually, I did not know, there was only actually one fast that was commanded in the Old Testament. I think it's in um, Leviticus 23, and it's on the Day of Atonement. There was only actually one fast that was commanded. And it, the passage just says that you'll afflict, it, it truly says you'll afflict your souls. It doesn't say fast, it says afflict your souls. But that talks a little bit about the nature of why fasting was done in the first place. It was a way to minimize the physical, enhance and focus on the spiritual. Right? But there was only one fast that was actually commanded. We see it a lot of different places in God's Word, in the New Testament as well. Um, but it isn't actually commanded except for that one place. So anyway, let's read Isaiah chapter 58, verse 1. You'll see, again, Isaiah is prophesying just before in kind of the initial part of the Babylonian captivity. Um, chapter 58, verse 1. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up their voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge? Behold, in the day of your fast you find pleasure and exact all your labors. Behold, you fast for strife and debate, and to smite with the fist of wickedness. You shall not fast as you do this day to make your voice be heard on high. It, is it such a fast that I have chosen? A day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Wilt thou call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke? Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor 
that they are cast out to that that are cast out to thy house. When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. Um, this is something that Jesus in Matthew chapter six talks about with the Pharisees and Sadducees. Too, same kind of thing. They fasted ostentatiously. They afflicted their souls and then made sure everybody knew they were afflicting their souls. So what was the benefit? They weren't focusing on the spiritual. They were focusing on the apparent. They wanted people's praise. Moreover, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to fast. Oh, fasting, fasting. <laughs> That's what they did. That's what they did. Verily I say to you, they have their reward. In other words, it's when you look at rewards in the Bible, we're not going to go into this now, but when you look at rewards in the Bible, it's not so much what you did, it's how you did it. It's not that you were a king and did great things, it's the heart with which you did it. It's not that you fasted, it's that you fasted because you really wanted to draw closer to God. It's not that you were a servant to some man somewhere in the first century that nobody knows about and you're dead and your name is never going to be known. It's the fact that you were not serving not as a man pleaser, like Colossians 3 talks about, but you actually did it from your heart, like you would if you were serving the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's not what you did, it's how you did it. Right? They have their reward. They're going to get the praise of men. That's it. There's no other reward in it. Right? Because of how they live. Um, so, just reminders, instances of fasting. You remember Jesus in the wilderness fasted for 40 days. Moses does the same thing. Well, we're not going to read this. Paul talks about the fact, the fact that he was in fastings often. In 2 Corinthians 6, he talks about that. And obviously Paul, um, you know, when he talks about uh, the tribulations he went through, I think it's in 1 Corinthians 11, he says that he has on him daily the care of all the churches. He fasted and prayed because that was the only way he was going to be able to, to intervene, to intercede for these people. Because he wasn't going to see them. He wasn't going to see them. I mean, he saw, I think I mentioned before, we were studying Philippians in um, the main service with Pastor David. The founding of Corinth, he's there several years later, and then he writes the epistle five years later. He never sees those people otherwise. It's not like he drove over to Philippi, for heaven's sake. He didn't do that. So he fasted and prayed often because he was focusing on the spiritual. He was interceding on their behalf. So, anyway. Um, Moses did for 40 days. Those are great records. Um, uh, Harry Neal and, and Pastor uh, Nick. Nick had been going through that, those records in Exodus. How he goes up, you know, various ups and downs to Mount Sinai, and he comes down one time, and Joshua says, yeah, that sounds like parties down there. And Moses says, no, that's a party. That's, that's not a party. That's God. That God that's what that is. And he comes down, he breaks the tablets, you know. And then when he goes up to intercede on their behalf, he fasts for 40 days and 40 nights. And an interesting sidelight, I'm sure they mentioned this, but the next time he goes up to do the tablets thing, God says, you make your own tablets. <laughs> <laughs> I made them the first time. You make them this time. He really does. <laughs> Elijah does too. We won't get it. Um, the last thing I think we're going to look at is the idea, the whole idea. Let's read this. Just read this last uh, verse in John chapter 3. In uh, verse 10, And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. Now, for some people, the idea of God repenting, as we think of repentance, is a problem, because it indicates that God can change, and God is supposed to be unchangeable, immutable, that sort of thing. The only thing I want to point out here is, um, is the Hebrew word, first of all, nacham. Hebrew is a great language. Because it's very graphic. There aren't a lot of words. Um, there's only like 8,600 words, Hebrew words in the whole Old Testament. Or, you know, distinct Hebrew words. One of this, this is, this is repent, and the fundamental meaning of it is to sigh. It's, to, it's like, you know, it's that kind of graphic picture of being sorry for something. Right? That's what the fundamental meaning of this word is. 
Um, so I, I simply want to, look, this is a word that I think has become a religious term. It's sort of, this is maybe my, only my idea, I'm not necessarily saying you have this idea, but I think there is the idea of repent being, repent, you know, that sort of thing, and, and not that altar calls are bad, but kind of coming up to the altar and, you know, that sort of emotional thing, but that's not repent. That is not what the Bible talks about with repent at all. I, I'm not saying for some people that that emotional part may not be a portion, but it is not the major portion. Not at all. Biblically, it's not the major portion. As we can see just from this verse, the major portion of repent is there's a change in behavior. You actually change how you were acting. It isn't, it isn't just a mind thing. It's a doing something different thing. And God, notice, God changed what he was going to do based on what they did. It's the same for us, guys. It's the same for us. God changes how he deals with us. And we see it in we see it all over the place. Let's look at let's look at Luke chapter three. Because this occurs in the, in the New Testament, both with Jesus, but first with John the Baptist. So let's look at Luke chapter three. Read a few verses here. Jesus does the same uh, preaching, he preaches the same message, message, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He preaches that as well after John is in prison. But let's look at Luke chapter three, just to read about a few verses. Uh, too much here. Let's see. Let's, let's uh, start in verse 7. Then, Luke chapter 3, verse 7. Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him. This is John the Baptist. O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Now, that's a message that's going to welcome them, right? <laughs> he calls them a generation of vipers. Right? This isn't, I mean, oh, secret sensitive. John the Baptist was not. And now the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. First indication that it's fruit that is the important part of repent. It's not what you think. It's not what we feel. It's what you actually do. Okay. <clears throat> and this is what's interesting, though. And the people ask him, saying, what shall we do then? He answered and said to them, <laughs> Come down to the altar and kneel down, bow your head, feel really good, cry. No. He doesn't say that. And I'm, I'm, again, I'm not saying those things are bad. I'm not saying they might not be a part, maybe initially, of a repentance for someone. But that's not the, that's not the kernel of repentance. That's not the kernel of repentance. So he answers them uh, specifics. He says, He answered and said unto them, He that has two coats, let him impart to him that has none. And he that has meat, let him do likewise. So he says, Give your excess away. Okay? This is what you do. If you want to repent, give your excess away. <clears throat> then came also the publicans. Who knows what the publicans were? Maybe your translation says it. The tax collectors. Right? That's the publicans. Tax collectors. <clears throat> To be baptized, and said unto the master, what shall we do? And he said unto them, exact no more than that which is appointed to you. Don't <coughs> try to extort more taxes. Because that was, that was why the publicans were hated. They took money that they weren't entitled to. That was what they did. That was what Matthew was a publican, for heaven's sake. He was one of the twelve, and he was a publican. Anyway, uh, let's go on. And the soldiers likewise demanded him, saying, And what shall we do? Now these are soldiers are Romans. They're militarily keeping the peace. It's not like they're the guard that would be in Rome. But these are invested by Rome with power. They're keeping the civil peace in Israel. They would sort of be right-hand men to the Sadducees and Pharisees, who were sort of the, the religious government. They were the civil government. They were the civil authority, like our police might be. Okay? So these are the guys that are coming to John saying, Okay, John, what should we do? And he said, do, uh, verse 14, letter part, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. He gives the most specific behavioral things to do. When his original message was, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay. So, point being, repentance is 
Um, you may remember the Greek word for repentance in, when you see it in Luke 3 when you see John the Baptist, it's the Greek word metanoia. Metanoia is the, the root form. And it means, it really means to do a 180. It means to go from that direction over here in your mind. But the point being, it was never mind only. It's, it's got to be heart. It's got to, it's got to be born out in behavior. You didn't repent. Like if you're asking a question, well, you know, since there's no condemnation in Christ, can I still, you know, like, uh, have, a, have an affair outside my marriage because I can't sin? You're asking the wrong question. You never came to Christ in the first place. You never repented in the first place. Your behavior didn't reflect a change that indicates you ever believed that He was the Savior in the first place. So I'm not going to answer your question. There's no good answer to that. See? So the, the point being repentance is behavior. Let's look at Colossians chapter 3. I alluded to this earlier. And this is probably one of the last. Yeah, this is actually the last place we're going. Colossians chapter 3. Verse. Uh, these are great verses. Just great verses. I think of, of Paul writing these epistles under house arrest in Rome, which is really, I mean, he was in prison, but he wasn't in prison like he was later before his martyrdom. The, the imprisonment at the end of the book of Acts is really house arrest. Um, he, and it specifically says in the record in Acts 28 that people you know, came and went freely. Now, could he... <coughs> Was he probably either assigned guards or maybe literally chained to the guards? Yes. But it wasn't the kind of imprisonment that he would have gone through before his martyrdom. But the point being, under house arrest in Rome, he's writing these little, you know, these are fairly short. Like Colossians is four chapters. Philippians is four chapters. Ephesians is six chapters. Um, and um, Philemon is 21 verses. So he writes these down, and 2,000 years later, guess what we're reading? From that guy sitting in that house of rest in Rome. Colossians 3.22. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. Now, first of all, just reminding you, who's he talking to? Servants. So these guys aren't the top of the heap, right? I mean, they're, they're the underlings. They're the guys that are standing over in the corner keeping an eye on him and they indicate he needs something and then they jump. And they say, how high on the way up? And those are servants. That's what they're supposed to do. <clears throat> servants obey in all things your master according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasures, but in singleness of heart fearing God. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. The word heartily is the Greek prepositional phrase that means out of your soul. Ex psuche, out of your soul. That's what heartily means. That's how they translate it, which is a great translation. Knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. Now, next verse. The reason I wanted to point this out. God's assignment of rewards in eternity depends on us, not on Him. Verse 25. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. Right? So the way God deals with us there is conditional on what we do here. Very plain. Right? So repentance is actual action, not just thoughts. And the other thing about that Jonah 3.10 verse is, is very simple. God predicates how he deals with me as an individual on how I deal with what he tells me to do. And if I'm an obedient servant, he can do more with me. If I'm not, you know, he's got to send me. He's got to try to get me back to on the right track. Like he did in Israel so many times with so many prophets in the Old Testament. So that's all. I will close the prayer and then to get uh, questions and comments, we'll entertain them. Heavenly Father, thank you for, again, for your word, for um, working in our hearts to believe what we read and do 
what it says. And that we can listen and obey. And that we can be better at that as time goes on. That we are growing into becoming Christ-like, like your word talks about. Becoming steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. I thank you again for these men, for their taking the time to be here. We, uh, I, I thank you that you have given men the responsibilities you have as individual Christians, with men as husbands and fathers, and as leaders in the church. And we pray for your strength, for your wisdom in doing what you have <clears throat> made us responsible to do day by day. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Okay, questions or comments?